Hi everyone and welcome to this latest video interview for the New Scientist Book Club. I'm Alison and I'm here with Kelly and Zach Wiener-Smith, authors of the brilliant A City on Mars, which is our latest read. I should add that it's also the winner of the Royal Society Trevedi Science Book Prize, which I judged. I really loved it. I mean, a science book with cartoons in it, what, what isn't? To like. <laughs> um, so welcome Kelly and Zach. Where about you guys today? Thanks and thanks for having us here. We're uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Excellent. Well, welcome to the book club. Um, the subtitle of your book says it all really. Can we settle space? Should we settle space? And have we really thought this through? But can you guys tell us a bit about the book and kind of why you decided to write it in the first place? You want to start? Sure, sure. Uh, well, um, it really starts with our last book. We we'd written a book called Soonish, which was a, just kind of a, a much lighter, happier book about future technologies. And some of the stuff we got into was like, well, what if space launch gets a lot cheaper? And then another space question was, um, what can you do with asteroids? And uh, we had kind of a weird experience, which was that um, w- one of the technologies we were talking about as like a cool future thing was reusable rockets. And it actually happened while we were writing uh, we, like this, we were like, this This would really make things cheaper and totally different. And then we had to actually keep updating our number on how often it had happened up until press time. Mm-hmm. And then meanwhile, when we talked to asteroid people, and I think in retrospect, we'd mostly talked to like advocate and entrepreneurs, um, they, we would be like, well, what happens if like a regular person or like even a, like, like a bad person can just move asteroids around in the space? Are there are rules about that. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so some of the better ones were like, uh, you know, there, I think there are rules about that. And, uh, but I, you know, we didn't, we couldn't get a lot of detail. So it was this weird world where we were like, oh, so we can all go to space, but the rules are unclear on what you can do. Like, it'd be cool to write a book about how that might play out in reality in terms of like governance and society. Although our editor said, don't say governance. On a cover. Um. <laughs> Too boring. Yes. We, we actually started off pretty excited about space settlements. Like, yes, there were some things we were concerned about, but we kind of wanted to see space settlements happen because we're sci fi nerds. But then yeah. two years in, we were like, oh. uh. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like there should, was there nothing out there already that had kind of addressed this for a general readership? It feels like it's the kind of subject that people would like to read about. There are a lot of books uh, on this topic, but most of the books are written by uh, like advocates and people who are excited about the idea, which is how we started out also. Um, but there aren't a lot of books that are taking a more critical look at space settlement or also taking a look at like the international law stuff. But recently there have been more books like Erica Nesbold wrote a book on ethics. Uh, Fred Sharman wrote a book on sort of like the history of the community. Uh, so there has been more stuff coming out. Um, mm-hmm. But at the time, there weren't a lot of books that were being critical uh, of space settlements. Yeah, I, I, w- I would say that there was some stuff that was more on the critical end, but it was mostly like academic, whereas the um, pro stuff tended to be pop science, like with pictures of spaceships. Uh, so mm-hmm. the, the, the competitiveness might not have been there. Yeah. So you guys are come. You're not kind of experts in this area. Tell tell us a bit about your your backgrounds and where you're kind of coming at this from. Uh, so I study parasites. I'm a, a scientist who study like my PhD was on a brain infecting trematode of fish. So nothing about space <laughs> settlement at all. But I, you know, I think that doing or going through grad school teaches you how to learn and teaches you how to find information. And so we didn't come at this problem with the right background. But between the two of us, we were both willing to read for hours a day for four years. And so we were able to learn a lot in that amount of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, the, the only thing I would want to add is I feel like often people. Oh, so I'm a cartoonist, uh, so nothing. Even less qualified. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have an English degree. That's like an anti-qualified. Um, no, but but um, I feel like a lot of people in our position are very tempted to be like, well, as outsiders, we were extra insightful, but we didn't feel that way at all. We were like, we're, as outsiders, we have to do all the homework from the get go. So so you know, most of our time was spent with our noses in books and and then circling back to experts. Okay, so where did you dive in first then? Because your book is like split into sections. Which was the first thing that you guys decided to to kind of get to grips with? I think one of the first things we started reading about was uh, polar expeditions to yeah. try to figure out how polar expeditions might have lessons for early space expeditions. Mm-hmm. And none of that ended up in the book. <laughs> uh, so we, we ended up going There's down a little. There's like a paragraph. Yeah, like yeah. a really interesting, well-researched paragraph. Uh, but then after that, we started reading about... Um, health in space just to kind of understand what we know about how bodies mm-hmm. respond to the space environment uh yeah yeah, yeah I, I think i think right when we started we knew it was going to be like a lot of topics so i remember like ha- like the library began as one bookshelf and it like the initial one had like a really random assortment it was like 
there was a book on economics of communes that ended up like not being super relevant, although we, we did write a paper on it. And then there was like space law and human physiology and all these polar exploration trips. There was actually, I remember reading about like the economics of pirate ships. Like we were like at the very beginning, we were looking at like every avenue. Um, and then much later, it got reduced way down. There's actually a lot of topics we, we, we know a lot about that did not end up in the book. Yeah. You said communes. That was a bit that I found really fascinating because it hadn't really struck me what a kind of indentured worker would be facing if they were in, well, you call it Moscow, your your city, <laughs> your city on Mars. Who knows how you came up with that name? But um, yeah, just the, the fact that you're, you're, you have what there's one employer, you're yeah. so far from home, you're kind of, you're stuck, right? There's no more extreme version of a company town ever created, you know, so like if you do have a SpaceX company, in addition to needing to provide, uh, you know, the basic things that company towns provided on Earth, like sanitation and stores to go to, they're also supplying even the air that you breathe. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, you know, it's extreme. And additionally, company towns on Earth, there's this benefit where if uh, employees are feeling like they're not being treated well, they can leave. And that's where they have the power, like they have the ability to go get a different job. But if you're on Mars and it's the first town, you can't leave. Like, their rockets can only leave every two years because that's, you know, you, you've got to wait till a window where Earth and uh, Mars are going to be, like, close together because um, they don't travel around the sun together. Uh, and that's going to be really expensive. Like, it's probably unaffordable to get a ticket back home for most people. And so, yeah, yeah. pretty extreme. The, the other thing that was, we, we really were happy with that chapter, although it was, it was really hard to research, but, like... You know, there's a very strong tendency in books like this to spend a lot of time on exactly the relevant chemical reactions, what size of rocket you need, what sort of power source, et cetera, and then be like, I don't know, direct democracy with no citations or anything. And and so, you know, it turns out in almost all these cases, there's a body of literature. Conveniently, in cases like communes or company towns, there's like an extremely large body of literature and even some regularities between different settings. And so that really opens up a lot of research possibilities that as far as we could tell generally haven't been done we, we discovered there were loads of things that people would say about social possibilities or yeah. governance structures that could be researched and then when you ask people why why has no one researched this the answer was usually something like well they'll figure it out but you're sending people to like in an environment where they would be very likely to die like it's a very harsh <laughs> environment why not do the research ahead of time and see what scholars have learned about like common problems so you can avoid these things yeah I think I think that's really true and I also think what you just said Zach as well is really what I loved about the book that um lots of lots of books about kind of space or travel to space I'm a sci-fi fan as well um they they sort of imagine the rockets and and the big uh I don't know frontier the big exploring thing whereas you guys bring it back down to like what would it actually be like for you as just a normal person how how terrible would your life be if you were in space or if you had <laughs> gone to Mars and it's pretty terrible. Like you have a line like the worst nuclear winter on earth or something like that would still be way, way easier to survive <laughs> than life on Mars. <laughs> um, but yeah, tell us about your, um, is she, Ast- she's called Astrid. You're kind of, you're every, <laughs> every woman that, um, that we're kind of following her adventure. Why, why did you come up with her as a kind of technique to tell your story? That came in really late in the process. So, um, you know, the, the vast majority of time spent on this was just research. Um, and then probably the next big thing was just writing it all up in a coherent way. Um, but, you know, we kind of felt like this is a pretty thick book and it also just covers a lot of topics and that requires the audience to follow along and often like start over from zero on a new topic all of a sudden. And so part of what we hope is going on is we added this character at the end of each chapter who's kind of just like adding a little levity and maybe sort of summarizing in a way. Um, Mm. uh, and so, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the use of like jokes and stories, to be honest, is just kind of like larding the like thicker stuff that's like really important, but sometimes maybe would be a little difficult to get through. I I seem (laughs) to also remember our editor saying, uh, at the end of each chapter, you need to remind people how this is going to impact like individual people's lives. Mm. So maybe we should follow like a person through and then Zach came up with Astrid. Yeah. Yeah, well, she's great. You describe yourselves in the book as the space bastards. Um, can you tell us? Can you tell us why? And has anyone agreed with that assessment of your? Oh, <laughs> uh, you can. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, so you know, we said we we, we started off as, as pretty enthusiastic about the likelihood of of near term settlement, and over time we changed our mind. But it, it was a, it was a long research process, so it was like two years in before we came to that point. By then, we had made friends in this community, and it turns out at least some of that friendship was based on agreement uh with their viewpoint 
<laughs> and it, 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 at some point, we just started kind of like privately in secret being like, you know, I'm not sure about this and I'm not sure about this. And I think this guy's just like making stuff up. And we started calling ourselves the Space Bastards in secret, like it was a secret club, like we should get signet rings or something. <laughs> and still think we should and I, I think that was actually in retrospect a kind of like anxiety mitigating joke because we we like a just like we're terrified because we we are like we are cowardly hobbit people we actually don't like fighting with people or telling people they're wrong um mm -hmm. but but also it was just like um you know we, we actually we did i would say lose friends over some of the stuff we published like not like super tight friends but definitely people we thought of as like people who liked us do not like us anymore and and the other part of it, the bastard part, is also just like, you know, part of being a, a balloon popper about a science topic is you end up talking to people and they say, like, when we go to space, we'll all be kinder and wiser. And you're just like, sorry, there's no data for that. Um, and so you inevitably feel like a bastard. And when it's missed about space you call yourself a space bastard i guess yeah that, this community <laughs> says so many nice uplifting things and it's so fun to be around them but like what we're thinking in the back of our heads is no no no, no you can't support that claim with data yeah. and, and yeah it just made us feel like bastards yeah yeah, yeah. oh well i'm sorry to hear that uh, it didn't go down that well but it, i mean it, it has with readers i hope mostly so <laughs> well yeah. And I should say, you know, for, for all the friends we've lost along the way, we also have made new friends because of the book. We've mm -hmm. had people write us to say, like, this has needed to be said, but I didn't want to be the bastard who said it. <laughs> uh, or like, you know, I've been thinking this, but I wasn't sure if it was true. And like, we have had a lot of people write us and say, you know, thank you. This was great. Or I study rockets and I didn't realize there was all this other stuff to think about because, mm -hmm. you know, no one can like study everything. And so we've had a, we've had a really nice response from the community, too. And have you, have you sent out signet rings to all of them as well? So, <laughs> yeah. We should. We, we really should. should yeah. yeah. Good investment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what's it like writing a book like this together? How, how often do you fall out with each other or um, and how do you kind of put together a chapter? Well, so uh, as we mentioned, we're cowards, and that helps us also because we're not very aggressive with each other either. Um, but so we we kind of we both do research. Zach would read like the uh, astronaut memoirs and the reviews and the textbooks, and then I would uh, read some textbooks and then also dig down into the initial primary literature to see, you know, like if a review said, "Oh, we know a bunch about this," like, well, how good is the data? How large is the sample size and stuff like that? So we'd sort of split that. And then I would write a draft with what I thought the main points for each chapter should be and how we should organize them. And then Zach would go through and sort of do some reorganizing and some rewriting and add some jokes and add some historical stories or stuff he picked up from the biographies. We'd kick it back and forth a couple times, mm -hmm. send it out to experts, uh, and then send it out to non-experts to make sure we were explaining it in a way that non-experts could understand too. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, we added the art. And it was, there were definitely, no, that's not, <laughs> oh yeah yeah there, there were definitely a couple times where like i would kick a chapter to zach and he'd be like no that's not at all the point we wanted to make or he would kick a chapter to me and i'd be like no what no a horrible organization and like so we, we both had times where we shot down the other one's work and that for me at least hurt initially but i think that our egos are more tied up in the book being good than mm -hmm. like you know whatever yeah. is happening between the two of us <laughs> at that moment uh and and i think in the end that we both recognized that the chapters were better if we took the other person's criticism seriously, uh, yeah. what would you add? I would say there was the the, the fist fight. Uh, Come on, that's that, not. That, funny. Okay, all right. There was, <laughs> You're supposed to be our joke guy. There, there was uh, <laughs> the, the one actual argument was uh, uh, about software. It was it was a sort of religious dispute about um, Microsoft Word versus Google Docs, which oh boy, uh, yeah, big question. But, but, but unfortunately, no, no, nothing exciting. No, like. Uh, chair thrown through a window or something i, I wish i had something cool to report but, nope, uh, no, but no, mostly no. we worked together yes yeah. <laughs> which what did you find the most surprising in in your research which do you which bit of the book kind of shocked you most to to include i think a turning there were two turning points for me yeah. one was learning um how little data we have on how human bodies respond to space and how not relevant the data we do have are for places like Mars. Mm -hmm. So like on the International Space Station, you're protected from radiation by the mag Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, and the essentially zero gravity that they experience while they're in free fall is different than the 40% gravity on Mars. So mm -hmm. we just really don't know how human bodies will do on Mars. And that surprised me. I thought we knew more. But then the other thing was that the moon has like very little carbon. 
And we're carbon-based life forms. And so to grow plants, we're going to need carbon. And just thinking about like, you know, some people want to settle the moon, start research stations, just all the basic stuff we take for granted that we're going to need to take with us when we go somewhere just kind of made how difficult and how much of a pain in the rear end every step of the process will be like really mm-hmm. clear. And, and Zach noted that the 96 bags of urine and feces left behind by the Apollo astronauts are probably the most concentrated sources of carbon. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, space is tough. What about you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The only thing, one, one thing that's sort of more generally surprising was that like um, you really regularly see articles in prominent publications that presumably have fact checkers that are just simply wrong. Um, that like don't pass the smell test. Um, and, and so like, like the carbon thing is a good example where this is like an absolute showstopper for a lot of things people talk about, like growing plants on the moon. You, you literally cannot do it. Like they can't build themselves. It's like you, you don't have the Legos to make the structure. And and there's a similar thing with helium three. It's all over the place that will mine helium three on the moon. There's a race with China and X Y Z, and it's just like it doesn't even pass the smell test. Like when you just run some very simple numbers, you can write it down on a napkin and convince yourself this is crazy. Um, but it gets repeated over and over and over until it becomes like an accepted truth. And so and mm-hmm. that's the kind of stuff that ended up, like we turned us into space bastards, where we just became skeptical of everything because um, there's just a lot of like stuff that's very uplifting and exciting and so people repeat it and it's 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 often just not true yeah have you found uh describing yourself as sci-fi nerds have you found less enjoyment in kind of traveling to space sci-fi since learning all of this stuff or do you still like it or maybe like it even more oh that's a good question i I think so everyone tells us we should watch for all mankind and i don't think either of us have done it yet that would probably be ruined i would guess because they're uh no you don't think i so? watched one episode and you really liked it. it and then i yeah. didn't have time to watch more i don't know as, as I, I already confessed to being an english major like you know uh my view is essentially like i if, if, if you can like twist everything to make a good story i kind of don't care like science is science go to science and science land you know like i mean like you know shakespeare took all sorts of stories and like completely hacked them to pieces and and no one seems to mind or even remember those old stories uh so i i, I don't really have a you know, problem with that sort of thing generally. For me, it's like you create a world, you decide what the rules are. Mm-hmm. And as long as you're consistent, I'm in. Like, I don't care if those rules actually meet the physical rules of our universe, as long as you're consistent. But I do feel like I appreciate the expanse a little bit more because it did a like really nice job of imagining mm-hmm. like what it would be like to live in the belt and what that might do to human bodies and where they're allowed to travel. And I, so I don't know. I still love it all. Okay, well, that's good to hear. And um, what's what's next for you guys? Is there more space to follow or are you moving on to a different topic? We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Enough people hate us. It's We're ready to go. Um, someone else can hate us next. Someone, yeah, there's yeah. someone else can be hated. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm a, as I mentioned, I study parasites. I think my next book is going to have something to do with parasites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Zach is working on some kids' books. Yep. So we're oh, so you're not, uh, not working together then. Uh, we we have a we're we're talking about the next us thing, but like an us thing is like a five year commitment. Uh. <laughs> and we're just not sure we're going to be no. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. no, I I I want to write about parasites, and Zach's not interested in parasites. I have no interest in writing yeah. kids' books, so we decided we would do our own projects and then come back together for a new book. So uh, it'll it'll be a while before yes. the next Wiener Smith. Yes, I think we also we also kind of like stacked stuff we wanted to do while we couldn't do it while writing this book. Like this book was like life consuming, as the bibliography will inform you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so there's stuff we wanted to do in the meantime. Yeah, no, fair enough. Okay, so last my last question is: Do you think uh, we will ever settle Mars? And if you could jump into the future, would you would you do it if you could? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I think we will eventually. I don't need to be there. Uh, As an ecologist, like there's so many Mm -hmm. species we haven't even discovered on this planet yet. I would never want to leave for like the wasteland that is Mars. Uh, Although there might be interesting bacteria or microbes, um, but I, I love it here. Uh, yeah, I would say I, I've actually I found it kind of unfortunate now and then I'll see someone who I think enjoyed our book and will go online and say a city on Mars proves we'll never go to Mars. And we, we don't say that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we we're just like arguing about the time scale and what's feasible now and desirable now. But, but yeah, absolutely. There's no reason it's, it's not technologically forbidden. So given enough wealth and technology, it'll probably happen. Um, whether I'd want to go for me, I think we have I can't remember if we kept this line, but we said something like. I wouldn't go to space now. Maybe the, when there's like three Starbucks on Mars, then it will be ready for someone like me. Uh, like it'd be, it'd be absolutely cool to visit, but like, you know, the death rate for people who go to space right now is still uh, pretty high. Uh, so I'm not, not taking the first starship to Mars. 
Fair enough. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on and chatting to the book club. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed the book. So thank you, Kelly and Zach. Thanks, Alison. Thank this was so much fun. <laughs>